In today's episode, we talk about the complex and often misunderstood world of anxiety with our guest, anxiety specialist and hypnotherapist, Karina Price. Join us as we explore the vulnerable insights, practical strategies and personal experiences to help you navigate the challenges of anxiety. This episode promises to be a powerful resource for anyone seeking to better understand and manage anxiety. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Welcome to The Secrets in the Powder Room, where we share stories and open up conversations about all the secrets women are forced to keep out of fear and shame. I'm Louise Bryant, professional certified coach, NLP practitioner, intuitive eating counsellor and trauma-informed domestic abuse specialist and survivor. We're here to support you on your healing journey and help you feel like you're not alone. This is not to be a replacement of your own professional, medical or legal advice. This podcast contains adult language and content. Listener discretion is advised. Karina is an award-winning anxiety specialist, hypnotherapist and qualified yoga teacher who has a personal journey with anxiety. With a warm and empathetic approach and a solution-focused mindset, Karina helps individuals find inner calm and overcome their anxiety challenges. Through her own journey, Karina brings a relatable perspective and practical tools to support others on their path to healing and self-discovery. Hello, Karina, and welcome to the Secrets in the Powder Room podcast. Hello, Louise. Thank you so much for that lovely welcome. You're welcome. We're just so grateful to have you, and I'm really excited about this. Me too, me too. So Karina, can you share with us your personal journey and how you became an anxiety specialist and got into this space? Yes, of course. So my journey of becoming an anxiety specialist stemmed from my own personal experience of anxiety. So I struggled quite a lot when I was a child. I was extremely anxious, very shy, always in the background. And that kind of went with me through my teenage years and early on into my early 20s. And that largely stemmed from my my childhood situation. So both of my parents struggled with their mental health, so anxiety, depression, and my mum battled alcohol addiction throughout her whole life. So home life was quite chaotic. It was very unpredictable. And I guess I was always in a state of fight or flight, so always quite hypervigilant. Um, and there was periods of domestic violence in the home and being the eldest of five, I was always the one to kind of take that step to be the peacekeeper and to be on the lookout, always looking out for those verbal and non-verbal cues as to is it going to be safe? Is it going to be calm or is something about to to happen? So I was always quite curious as to why some of us struggle in the way that we do and why others are much more resilient or seemingly come across as much more confident and aren't as affected as much. That kind of planted the seed, my sort of childhood experiences and um, really kind of led me to want to help people with their well-being and their mental health. So I initially started off as a social worker in the child protection team. And it was during my training at university that my social anxiety really just went skyrocketed and I was really struggling. So I I even contemplated leaving university. It was so bad. I was just consumed by obsessional thoughts. Um, I I was always on edge and lots and lots of self-doubt, which quite often will go hand in hand with anxiety. I tried all the different techniques, Louise, um, and then I found hypnotherapy, and that was a game changer for me that helped me to reframe my negative thoughts, calm my nervous system. And later on, after my social work career, that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to go down the route of hypnotherapy and supporting people with anxiety. Wow, wow, what a journey, what a journey. I'm just so grateful that you're here speaking to our audience because I know lots of us can relate to what you've been saying and it's just always good to have someone on here that's really relatable and also walk the walk, live the journey, you know, and we can learn to do things in our career path. But unless we've really been there, I think it's hard for people to relate to us and understand how important what we're doing is and how that's going to impact them. So many survivors of trauma and abuse struggle with anxiety, as you know. So could you maybe shed some light on why anxiety often accompanies such experiences? Yes, of course. So neuroscientifically, traumatic events can actually lead to changes in the amygdala. So this is our fear center in our brain. And so when this happens, we can tend to be in a hypersensitive state and the brain is always on the lookout for for danger 
and fret. So what can happen is, is that our nervous system tends to then be in a heightened state of alertness and we can be triggered by anxiety even in non-threatening situations. So it could be things like um, sensory triggers like sound, touch, smells, even particular words that we might hear in just general everyday conversations could link us back to a traumatic event. And in addition to this, Louise, we've also got some changes that happen in the prefrontal cortex. And this is the very much the rational decision making part of the brain. So it's where we have our emotional regulation. And if we've experienced quite significant traumatic events in our life, we can actually have changes that happen here that make it more difficult for us to manage and regulate anxious thoughts and emotions. So that can also play a big part in how trauma can make us feel more anxious day to day. And in addition, we've also got the subconscious mind, which plays a significant role in processing um, trauma and um, difficult experiences we've had in our life. So we might be going about our our day to day lives. You know, we might be at work, we might be doing the school run, we might be popping to Sainsbury's to do a bit of a food shop. And consciously, we might be focused on the task at hand. But on a subconscious level, something very different might be happening. So our subconscious mind, it runs the show 90% of the time. So we're only consciously aware 10% of the day. So based on our past experiences, our, our beliefs, you can see the subconscious mind as kind of like a computer program and it's running in the background. So we might not be consciously aware that we've been triggered or that something's happening. And that's why sometimes we might experience anxiety or panic attacks it feels like it's come out of the blue because we're not consciously aware of what's going on in the background and our subconscious mind has kind of tapped into something that has made us react in a particular way wow wow yeah we talk about that in, in our courses and we call it like it was a superpower that we have because it's like your height your, your senses are heightened and it's almost like other people who haven't been through trauma don't understand why someone who's been through trauma can react in the way that they do. And that can cause issues, got it, with relationships sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there could be, you know, consciously we're in a, a situation where we might be having a good day or a good interaction with our loved ones. And if the subconscious mind links, it will, what it does is it tends to pattern match. So if it's pattern matching to try and keep us safe, it will identify last time you're in this situation or last time someone said those words, this bad thing happens. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's happening on a subconscious level. And that's why sometimes we can react in ways where we might become agitated or emotional or we might withdraw. We might not even consciously recognize why we're doing it. Um, and what is really important to know here, when it, particularly it comes to our nervous system, is that our nervous system likes what is familiar. OK, because if something's familiar, it thinks that we know how to handle the situation. We know how to get out of it. We know how to, to react to the situation. So the nervous system will always choose familiar chaos over unfamiliar calm. OK, so sometimes we might find ourselves in very similar situations and we think, well, how am I in this situation again? You know, I know it's not good for me or there might be particular behaviours or habits that we might be doing that we know aren't necessarily good for our mindset, for our anxiety levels. And or even in relationships, we might tend to have the same patterns emerging over and over. And that's the nervous system saying, you know, we, this is familiar to us. So let's keep doing it because we're, we're going to know how to react. OK, so that's sort of similar to traumatic attachment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Something else that came up for me when you was just talking. So my husband always says that, why do you have to always defend? Why are you, why are you always going to the defensive? I'm not having a go at you. And I, I, I tend to get like that. I'm quite loud. I'm, like, I'm a Londoner and I'm loud anyway. Yeah. But it's like sometimes I'm always reacting and I kind of feel like, the, you know, when you've been in a domestically abusive relationship or had any kind of past trauma, it's I feel like I have to constantly defend myself and it's not something that I'm in control of it's I try to explain this to him I can't help it I just yeah. go into fight mode absolutely and that is your emotional primitive part of the brain stepping in trying to protect you so our primitive responses are going to be so depression to so feel low down unmotivated not find any joy in life we might be feeling anxious so on edge overthinking sort of consumed by self-doubt or another primitive response is anger yeah so anger really is a primitive response designed to make us feel strong when we're feeling under threat so in that situation consciously you might be absolutely fine but again on a subconscious level where our trauma is stored and those unpleasant memories and experiences your subconscious mind will be saying 
oh, this, this doesn't feel quite right. So then we're going into that emotional primitive part of the brain where it's a it's an instinctive reaction, that anger to kind of defend ourselves. So it's a very normal, very healthy response, but it's just not helpful in our day to day lives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, anxiety can often be accompanied by feelings of fear and shame, especially for survivors of trauma and abuse. So how can we navigate and address these emotions to better manage our anxiety? Yeah, so quite often traumatic um, experiences can make us feel quite unworthy and it can also make our brain and our nervous system expect bad things. So the nervous system might be in a state of fight or flight constantly. And that's very typical for, for those of us who've experienced trauma. We're in a state of fight or flight over and over and over. And in the end, the, the nervous system says, let's let's just stay being hypervigilant because we just don't know what's around the corner. So what we really want to do is, is to tap into the body. We want to help the body to feel safe and to feel calm. And some very simple ways of doing that is focus on things like breath work. So most of us aren't breathing correctly. So if we're able to tap into Breath works help send a message to the nervous system that we're safe um, and that, that things are calm. It's kind of like tricking the brain, really, because when we're breathing nice and slow, big sort of, you know, diaphragm breathing, it's helping the nervous system to feel calm and regulated. So things like breath work, mindfulness is a great way to bring us back into the moment and any grounding techniques. So when we start to tap into those body sensations first it helps to regulate the nervous system which is key because when we're in a state of fight or flight when we're feeling anxious it can be really hard to talk ourselves out of it okay because that rational logical part of the brain kind of shuts down a little bit because the, the the fear center saying i need to protect you we don't need to worry about rational and logical right now so in order to help that rational logical part of the brain to kind of step up and be there we want to calm the nervous system so it starts to be a bit more freer so those are some of the techniques that we can do. In addition to that, hypnosis is a great way. And obviously I'm going to say that because I'm a hypnotherapist. <laughs> but you know, course, from my own personal experiences and helping, you know, hundreds of clients with anxiety, hypnosis really is a game changer because what hypnosis is, it's a deep state of relaxation and it's a highly focused state. And in this state, we can help to reprogram any limiting beliefs that we might have. You know, that's shame, that sort of negative self-doubt. Lots of us will have feelings that we're not good enough. And so consciously, we will try to, you know, reframe that. But it's on a subconscious level. Remember, that subconscious mind runs the show 90 percent of the time. So so hypnotherapy, hypnosis is a great way to reprogram our mind and it calms the nervous system in that highly relaxed state as well. Another modality which I absolutely love and I'm, I'm trained in is integral eye movement therapy. And this is a really effective therapeutic approach and what, it, what we do is we use eye movement exercises to help to process trauma and the good thing about this technique is that it's content three so we don't have to sit there talking in depth about the past experiences to be able to get to a point where we're kind of feeling a bit better it works to help to reduce any negative feelings and emotions that might be associated with that memory that's in the subconscious mind awesome awesome and another another key thing, which I will just add, actually, on, on top of that, is that quite often with anxiety, it really is a, a, an uncomfortable, unpleasant experience. You know, it's it's emotional, it's psychological, but it's physical. You know, it's a real sensation of fear in the mind, fear in the body. And naturally, we want to run. We want to run away from this feeling of anxiety. But avoidance will maintain anxiety and make it worse. So what we want to do is, is to try and lean into anxiety. OK, and so what I mean by that is if you can imagine that we were in uh, quicksand, naturally, instinctively, we would all be trying to get out, would be, you know, scrambling around. And as we do that, we would start to sink. But if we was able to kind of lean into the sand we would probably find a footing and be able to pull ourselves out. So it's, the same is true for anxiety. We don't want to stay there, but what we do want to do, we want to be curious. We want to lean into it and we want to see anxiety as not necessarily a bad thing, but more of the body's way of trying to protect us and see it as an emotional message. OK, so, you know, if we woke up in the morning, we we're making breakfast and we accidentally cut our finger, we would whack a plaster on it. We would just think, what do I need? You know, give ourselves a bit of self-love, self-compassion, pop that plaster on. But when we wake up, and we feel anxious. 
we we are the opposite. It's quite often it's self-deprecating talk. What's wrong with me? Am I ever going to feel normal? And when we do this, we start to spiral down. We feel worse. We feel more anxious. And we can freeze. So by leaning into it, a bit more self-compassion. What do I need? A bit like if we physically hurt ourselves when we're feeling anxious. What do I need right now? And then kind of lean into the anxiety and be curious about it. Yeah, I mean, I had. I remember having a conversation with my husband maybe a year or two ago going, I think I've got a bit of anxiety. And he was like, no shit, Sherlock. And I didn't have a word for it. It's only kind of recently that since I've sort of done the work and I've been working in this space, I've actually got a word for that. And I have finally realised that, that, oh, that's what that feeling was. Yes. Yeah. And that is, you know, it's very, very common, actually, Louise. There's this misconception with anxiety that it's just a state of nervousness or worry but actually it's it's much more that that goes with that it can be we might find ourselves overworking there could be avoidance we could be on edge we could be find ourselves crying there could be physical sensations involved with it brain fog uh, you know insomnia we might be feeling absolutely fatigued even after a full night of sleep so there's many different elements to anxiety that that goes with it essentially So from a neurological perspective, what's happening in the brain when someone's experiencing anxiety? Yeah, so when we think about the brain, if we think about there's the intellectual boss part of the brain, okay, and when we operate from this part of the brain, it's very rational, it's very logical, and it would always come up with answers based on a proper assessment of a situation. So when we're operating from this part of the brain, we're generally pretty calm, we might be confident, we might face day-to-day challenges, but we've kind of got that self-belief, you know, I, we can cope with this, we can deal with this right now, yeah? And But there is another part of the brain, and this is the emotional primitive part. And the centre and the, the most significant part of this brain is the amygdala, what I referred to before as the fear centre. And I like to refer to the amygdala as our very own safety officer, Louise. So it's kind of like we've got our own safety officer in our brain and it's there and it's trying to keep us safe. It's trying to protect us. And it will say absolutely anything to try and protect us and to make us really buy into those negative thoughts. And if it thinks our life is in some sort of crisis or danger, our safety officer will always step in to help. And it will override that rational, logical part of the brain. So that's why sometimes we might find ourselves in a situation where we can feel anxiety creeping in. And it might actually feel like we've got two different voices. We've got the good cop, bad cop. We've got that conscious, rational part of the brain saying, don't be silly. It's going to be fine. It's got nothing to worry about. And then you've got the safety office on the other part of the brain, which is absolutely negatively forecasting the worst possible scenario. And it's always the what ifs. What if this happens? What if this happens? Or this part of the brain might be negatively introspecting about the past. So going over past conversations, past situations, freeing us with self-doubt and making us feel pretty horrible. So the safety officer will always step in to help, but it has got its very own sidekick in that part of the brain. And that is the hypothalamus, which is known as our very own pharmacist. So if the safety officer thinks, oh, my goodness, life, life is pretty hectic. Life is pretty stressful right now. Then it's going to give its little you know, co-worker mate a little nudge. And that pharmacist is going to be pumping out stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline. And that is designed to make us be strong so we can fight the perceived danger or run away. So it's actually a really you know, good thing that's happening in our body when there's real danger, but not so good day to day. You know, like we've had a really stressful day at work or the car breaks down. We've we've, um, you know, got an unexpected credit card statement. In those situations, that saves your husband would perceive those as life or death situations. So the adrenaline would be pumping out. And that's when we start to feel our heart pounding, you know, palpitations. We might start to have a bit of a dodgy belly or our palms might start sweating or we just feel that our head is like pounding. And those symptoms, which are symptoms of our our body basically going to fight or flight, can then make us feel more anxious. So we're kind of trapped in a bit of a, a negative cycle here. And in addition to that, is that another part of that primitive emotional part of the brain is the hippocampus. So it's like a very own library. It's where we store all of our previous and sometimes inappropriate behavioural responses. So when the safety officer takes over, it's kind of like, let's go into your library and see how you normally cope. And again, quite often, it's not great coping mechanisms. It could be avoidance. It could be binge watching Netflix. It could be the emotional eating. It could be, oh, I'm going to have that extra glass of wine. Whatever it might be, 
it's it's going to keep going into that because it says, well, it helped you before. So I want you to just keep doing that. I don't care if you've got a better way of dealing with this. Let's just keep doing it. So that emotional part of the brain, essentially, Louise, is that safety officer is there to help us to, to protect us. But what can happen is for many of us, particularly in the modern day world, our primitive mind is hasn't evolved to the modern day world. OK, you think this this part of the brain is for hunter gatherer days, but now it can easily be triggered when perhaps, you know, we're we're scrolling on social media. And it's thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, the subconscious minds in the background comparing, judging, expectation. It could be that we just haven't slept well. It might be that our, our mobile devices, we're always available for people to be contacting us with those notifications. So those things, although they're not, you know, like a, a tiger about to pounce on us, that primitive mind will be perceiving that as danger, as overwhelm. So anxiety can be triggered quite easily in the modern day world, but essentially it's very healthy. These responses are very healthy. They're very normal, but like I said before, they're just not helpful day to day. Awesome. Awesome. So you gave us a couple of tips earlier on um, of how to, to deal with this. Do you have any more techniques or advice that you could give that might be useful when people are feeling anxiety that they could do themselves at home? Yes, absolutely. So simple techniques that we can do in the comfort of our own home that you can do at any any time of day. And they're going to take practice because don't forget the brain likes what's familiar. So when we start to make changes, when we start to think, actually, I, I don't want to feel anxious anymore. I'm going to try these new techniques. You're probably going to hear that safety officer saying things like, I haven't got time. Maybe you start tomorrow. This is never going to work or this is a bit woo woo, whatever it might be. So we, we really don't want to buy into that safety officer. So my, my first tip really is to start to be aware when you hear that negative voice voice and start to notice your own internal safety officer okay start to notice that safety officer and start to challenge the safety officer okay so just be curious even how i know this sounds silly but have that internal dialogue i know you're here to try and protect me but i've got this and then try to challenge is this helpful no and then redirecting not necessarily to a positive thought but to a much more accurate thought and so getting into the habit of being aware of your safety officer start to be curious and start to challenge the safety officer is a very simple technique that we can start to do some other techniques that we might um, help with anxiety is what I mentioned before so so breath work so we can quite easily you know hop on YouTube there's lots of amazing um, breathing exercises that we can do box breathing is my favorite one so you can go onto YouTube find box breathing and like I said before we can do this you know a couple of rounds of breath work for a couple of minutes it's going to help to regulate and calm your nervous system which is going to help you to ease and calm anxiety. With the saber-toothed tiger coming to get us, with deep breathing, if we're hiding from a from a tiger, we we would keep our breath really shallow and like quiet. Whereas if we were deep breathing, we wouldn't do that while we were hiding from a tiger because the tiger would find us. And that's a way of your brain knows that it's safe. And that's kind of another reason why the breath work, the yes, breath work absolutely. works. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So when we're hiding from a tiger, when we're running away from a tiger, our breathing changes. So by focusing on breath work and really focus on steady, deep breathing, we're, we're tricking the brain. We're helping it to think I'm safe. There's nothing to worry about. And that is going to be the, one of the fastest ways to help to regulate and calm the nervous system, sending a message of safety. Awesome. Awesome. So some other technique. I've got lots of techniques, Louise. OK, no, we want to hear all your techniques. Bring them on. Bring so, them on. So, 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 yeah, good. Yeah. So other 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 things that we can do. So physical movement. OK, so this doesn't mean that you're going to have to go out and do like a 5K run. It could be something as simple as doing some stretching at home or, you know, going on YouTube and do a 20 minute um, body work out or, you know, or walking. And when we're when we're moving, when we're exercising, we're releasing endorphins, we're releasing serotonin and dopamine. These are wonderful chemicals and neurotransmitters that are going to help to alleviate anxiety and to improve our mood. And in addition to that, the research tells us that exercise is on par with antidepressants in terms of the positive impact it has on our well-being. So it really is something that's quite accessible to all of us. Now, I would suggest even going for like a 10 or 15 minute walk, because as we're walking, what naturally is happening without us thinking about it is that 
Our eyes are moving side to side as we walk. So this lateral stimulation it actually activates the, the prefrontal cortex in our brain. So remember, that's the part of the brain that's very rational, logical, and it's the part of the brain that helps to regulate our emotions. So that it starts to really compete with resources in the amygdala, so the fear center of the brain. So by walking, this lateral eye movement is helping to essentially help that safety officer to take a chill pill and relax. And it's helping the other rational, logical part of the brain to become more alert and more active. So we might be in a, in a difficult situation, but we can, we can look at it at a much more balanced viewpoint and we're less likely to spiral down. So exercise, that's certainly my go-to. You know, if I've had a busy day and I can feel, I can hear my safety officer, I'm, I get my mat out in my bedroom and I'll do a strength workout or, or a stretch or something like that. So exercise is a good one. Yeah, I definitely notice in my own personal mood, my, my, my mental health, when I'm not exercising, how much I struggle. And then once I get my fitness regime back up and running, I feel so much better. And I think we kind of underestimate how powerful, how much power it, it, there is in just walking. I know for me, years ago, I'm like, What's the point in going for a walk? If I can't go for a run, there's no point going out. But the more that I've learned about the brain and how and 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 um, self care and how it affects you, you know, I'm always encouraging my clients, especially now where a lot of people are working from home and stuck at their computers or even before they're not walking to the train station, not walking to the office, not going to the prep for lunch. So now, if you get a yes. five minute break, a ten minute break between clients, between times, get outside. You just go walk around the block, walk up and down, walk around yeah. the garden. Just, I, I really encourage that, and it's just yeah. Absolutely. And again, you know, with lots of my clients, Louise, they'll say, well, I haven't got time or I'm just so busy all the time. And you're right, we're absolutely attached to our laptops most of the time. But again, really listening in, you know, that that's the safety officer. You haven't got time. You're going to be judged for taking some time up for yourself. You're, you're going to get behind in your work. So start to challenge that safety officer. Stop. Is this helpful? What's a much more helpful thought? Well, actually, I deserve to have some fresh air. This is going to make me focus more on my work this afternoon. If my, my anxiety levels go down, I'm going to be a much more attentive mom or friend or partner so start to challenge that safety officer because that's going to be showing up as that very negative limiting voice in your mind so yeah absolutely walking is a, is a great one I think as well like having that thing when people say to me I haven't got the time to move my body or that time to exercise I sort of say well I don't always say this to them but I kind of think well do you have time to be stressed because the more you kind of talk about the anxiety and all them thoughts that are going on for you the way that you're acting things that you're doing eating drinking wasting that time if you've just gone for a walk or done some movement you might not have to do that afterwards absolutely absolutely and sometimes I think we we tend to sort of underestimate the power of small steps so we just think oh well, I, I need to go to the gym three times a week that's the only thing that's going to de-stress me and make me feel good but in actual fact that 10 minute walk is is going to be you know a very small step towards helping to alleviate that stress alleviating that anxiety and helping us to feel a bit more calmer and grounded so always focus on those small steps and the brain will always move us away from pain aka the hard thing and towards pleasure the easiest thing so I always think when we're, we're trying to develop new habits always think how can I make this easy so just that five ten minute walk around the block that's easy. We can do that. How can I make this easy? Yeah, the path of least resistance is always what we will go yeah. for, won't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. that's a good point, isn't it? Making it fun. And I've, I've had clients that have said to me in the, in the past, oh, I've got to do a Joe Wicks workout. And I'm like, why are you doing it then? Because <laughs> that's counterproductive. Yeah. You're at least that stress hormone is coming up for you before you've even got to turning the workout on. You're already in there. Absolutely. You know, you're already in the wrong place just to start. So yeah, 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 you're absolutely right, Louise. What what other tips and advice have you got then? <laughs> okay, so other other advice. So I would also focus, this is sort of, you know, continuing on from that healthy lifestyle is our nutrition. So really thinking about how you might be able to introduce some foods that are going to make you feel good. And I always say, you know, good food equals good mood. So 90% or 80 to 90% of the serotonin is that feel good, happy, you know, chemicals. They are created in our gut. So we really want to think about what we're consuming, what we're feeding our bodies. So, you know, 
are we, you know, quite often if we're feeling overwhelmed and we're feeling stressed, you know, that safety officer, remember, is going to be dipping into our library. What do we normally do when we're stressed? So for a lot of us, it's the yes. unhealthy stuff. You know, it is. You know, I know for myself, it's chocolate. Like, get the chocolate out. I need chocolate. You know, it's crisps, chocolate, takeaways. It could be sugary food. You know, quite often it is sugary foods. You know, from an evolutionary standpoint, sugar makes us feel good. We have an instant hit of dopamine. So it's no wonder that's our, our go to. But for some of us, it might be alcohol um, and, and other things like that. So and I'm, I'm not sort of suggesting that we do anything too drastic. Again, how can I make this easy? It might be that we decide that we're going to start to just drink a bit more water. When we're dehydrated, that can also contribute towards levels of anxiety. So actually, I might just drink a couple more glasses of water or I might just introduce some more, you know, greens or fruits or lean proteins into my diet. So nothing to you don't have to think, oh, my goodness, I've got time to think about a new diet. But just think, how can I make this easy? What foods actually make me feel good and start to be curious? What foods help me feel good? And we all, we all know this. We all know the answers and, and trying to, um, you know, be kind to yourself and introduce a little bit of that. Yeah. And because of the, sort of the intuitive eating that I do is all about what foods make you feel good, what nourishes you, what gives you the energy, what foods. And, you know, keeping a food diary, I would say keep a food diary, but not in a sense of calorie counting, but more of a case of if I eat certain foods, how does that make me feel afterwards? Do I feel sluggish? Do I feel guilt? Do I feel pains? Yeah. Do I get headaches? And having that information as much as eliminating certain things, but not I'm not saying like to cut out food groups, but just kind of noticing, you know, I have a pizza and how do I feel afterwards? Like I feel great eating it. And I get this like real good feeling or a McDonald's, but then two hours later, my stomach is like griping and I've got a headache yeah. and I feel grumpy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a great way to be more intuitive and tapping into, you know, how is this making me feeling? Am I feeling energized? Am I feeling more relaxed? Or am I, is, has my anxiety levels gone through the roof, you know, a couple of hours later when we've had that, that sort of drop in our sugar levels? So absolutely. Um, another really good way is mindfulness. OK. And so the good thing about mindfulness is it's helping to bring us and ground us into the present moment. Now, research tells us that 50 percent of the time where our minds are either in the future, we're worrying about things that might happen in the future or they're in the past. We're overthinking something that happened yesterday, last week or a few years ago. And we're happiest in the moment of now. And really simple way just to ground ourselves into the moment of now could be simple things like, you know, what what can I hear? What can I taste? What can I see? So really just tapping in with our, our senses. What, what can I smell? You know, what does it feel like now? The sensation of my feet grounding and connecting with the ground on my back, you know, leaning into this comfortable cushion. Most of the time we're not mindful. We're, we're really kind of away thinking about our next to-do list, our laundry list of things to do with the day. And so just bring ourselves back to, to mindfulness and keeping it very, very simple. And again, there's lots of mindfulness techniques that we can tap into on, on you know, good old YouTube. Um, but we can just keep it very simple, even sitting for like 30 seconds and just noticing your breath, you know, the sensation of your breath going in and out of your nose or the sensation of your body connecting with the surface beneath you. So grounding is a really good one. And I like the, the term, I don't know where I heard this from recently, I think it was on a podcast, stop, breathe and be. There's such a lovely one. We can do this for 10 seconds. Stop, breathe and be. It's just like a little mini reset where we sort of, we're very mindful and we're in the moment. Yeah. And it's quite easy, isn't it? When like, this is just an example. Yesterday was Mother's Day here in the UK and oh, we was watching a movie together. Then we all went out and had some snacks and stuff and came back in and no one else was ready to watch the movie. And I laid there and it was quite easy to just pick up your phone and just do a little bit of scrolling or something like that. But I thought, no, I'm just going to stop. What, what was the thing you said before? Stop stop breathe and be stop breathe and be and that's exactly what I did I thought no one's here it's been a busy hectic day I'm on my own just be just enjoy this moment I didn't even switch the telly back on I just sat there enjoyed my lovely living room and just had that moment of stillness just to and it was lovely it's just kind of really being oh, present yes. and, and being there so it definitely definitely does work that sounds wonderful yeah that yeah. sounds good yeah perfect example of mindfulness just tapping into the to the moment and I think as well when I say people say like you know mindfulness practice it's like when you practice mindfulness regularly when it comes to situations like that it makes it so much easier to just be able to dip it out your tool belt doesn't it and just go oh I know how to do this and I can just be mindful just in the moment yeah. I think being able to if you practice mindfulness regularly yeah you're able to to, to yes get absolutely 
Yeah. And to start off with, you know, when we think about mindfulness, people might think, well, you know, I, I can't concentrate or it's too difficult or, you know, I've tried it a couple of times. But we've got to remember that the brain loves repetition. So, you know, that the, the brain, when we think about new habits, it's kind of like um, if we think about the brain and the, the neurons in our brain and the amount of neurons that we have on our brain are equivalent to if you looked out to a beautiful, clear night sky and there was just billions of stars. So that's the equivalent to how many neurons we've got in our brain. And so every neuron in our brain is equivalent to a tree. So if you imagine those branches of the, the tree, Louise, in those branches are our habits, our current habits. So we will never get rid of our habits unless there's something neurochemically wrong with our brain. Our habits will always be stored in our brain. So that's why it's so easy for us to revert back to our old ways of doing stuff. I'm just going to watch Netflix or I'm just going to go on my phone. So every time we repeat a thought or a behavior over and over and over, the, the brain, what's happening is that the neurons are firing together. They're firing, 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 and then they start to wire through repetition and then that starts to grow over the old habit and we then become an easier habit of like you say being able to mindfully tap into the moment it will become easier through every time that we practice practice and it will become part of our sort of everyday life and a and a really effective and powerful way to help calm and regulate the nervous system and to turn down the dial the volume on that safety officer yeah, and a lot of people say to me that they can't meditate because they have all these thoughts going on in their heads and they can't quiet their mind. And I always say to them, we're not monks in a monastery with like days of silence yes. and no distractions. And our brains are just designed to think, right? So it's yeah. about recognising them thoughts as thoughts and say, okay, off you go thought and come back into the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we call metacognition. So, you know, if you sat here now, Lou, and you didn't verbally answer me and I and I said you want you to internally ask yourself, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? You could consciously be aware of that thought going on in your mind. So if you think about metacognition, it's kind of just being aware of the thoughts that we're we're having. And this is a really nice way to be able to calm and regulate those busy thoughts. So rather than trying to stop them, rather than trying to you know change or challenge them, just be aware of them. So it's much like you think about thoughts. If we were stood in the middle of the motorway and all the cars are coming past us all directions and some were happy thoughts, positive thoughts, some were anxious or angry or someone more neutral, it would feel quite overwhelming stood in the middle. But if we take ourselves and we step out onto the embankment and we're just observing those cars on the motorway, so we're not trying to redirect them or stop them, we just become the observer of our own thoughts, we feel less overwhelmed, we feel more in control. So even in meditation, if you notice your thoughts creeping in, just observe them, just notice them. An actual fact that brings me on to my next tip uh, or technique, and that is guided meditation and guided hypnosis tracks. So again, you can access those online and listening to a guided meditation or guided hypnosis. It's just a little bit easier if you don't want to sit there in silence with your own thoughts. You know, you're normally guided by you know a nice, soothing, calm voice with some beautiful music in the background. And so your mind will begin to just wander. You'll be drifted in and out. And it can feel like a much more easier way to be able to start that meditation or relaxation practice. Do you have any? Yes, I have. Yes, I have indeed. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I have got some hypnosis tracks. So they're, they're, they're sort of infused with meditation. So a really nice way to help not only calm you and regulate your nervous system, but it's it's positive language suggestions that help guide your subconscious mind to feeling calmer, more positive, more confident. So just finally, are there any misconceptions about anxiety that you've often come across and what key insights do you have for anyone who has past trauma to help us understand more about our own anxiety? Yeah, so quite often, you know, people with anxiety, you know, there's misconception that it's just mind over matter or just just snap out of it or, you know, just just calm down. Um, but it's much more, you know, significant than that. It's a kind of a very complex anxiety is very, very complex. It involves genetic factors, biological factors. Um, environmental factors, you know, our subconscious mind. It's very, very complex in terms of what is going on in the mind and the body. So particularly when we think about, you know, trauma survivors, they've also got the additional sense of 
um, shame or that sense of you know guilt or feeling like they're it's their fault for feeling this way so what I would suggest is is just know that you know anxiety essentially is your your body's way of trying to protect you you've got a wonderful safety system in there that's trying really hard to keep you safe and a subconscious mind that's that's holding on to some of these past experiences the brain has got a very powerful way it's absolutely possible to help to manage and overcome anxiety so that we can turn down the dial on that safety officer fear center part of the brain so what i would suggest is to maybe sort of practice some of these techniques again be curious when you hear that negative safety officer you know think about what what is this message that i'm hearing right now and try and challenge and redirect and perhaps use just one or two of these techniques you know we don't have to buy into all of it some of it might be working for you others you might you know prefer to do something completely different so experiment and give yourself permission and the time to do that and it's really key to to not beat yourself up when you've got anxiety you know we're, we're 10 times harder on ourselves than we are on other people so when you're having a bad day when you're feeling a bit overwhelmed just think you know from a best friend brain what would I be saying to my best best friend right now what would I be saying to my best friend I'd be really kind and compassionate and I'd probably be helping them and supporting them and reassuring them oh, thank you thank you so if anyone wanted to connect with you or find out more about what it is that you're offering, how can they do that? So you'll be able to find me on my social media. So Instagram and Facebook at Karina Price Hypnotherapy. Um, and I've also got a free relieve anxiety guide, which I'll pass over to you, Louise, um, that people can tap into as the first point. Yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, this has been amazing. And it's just so nice to hear your wealth of knowledge on this subject. And I'm sure that people listening will get lots of information from this. Well, thank you so, so much for coming and talking with us today. And I look forward to maybe having you on again. And we can talk some more about this subject because it's obviously such a great topic. And, you know, so many people are suffering with anxiety and people don't even know they've got anxiety so you know it'd be good to absolutely absolutely yeah. thanks so much for having me and it's been a pleasure and I'd love to come back on and have a chat with you again yes lovely okay we'll take care and we'll see you next time thank you for listening to this episode of secrets in the powder room with me Louise Bryant on anxiety with the wonderful Karina Price remember you're not alone with the struggle of anxiety Stay connected with us as we continue to dive into important topics like this in future episodes. If you'd like to learn more about Karina Price and her work, be sure to check out her social media and take advantage of her free anxiety guides she offers. All links in bio.